So today we're delighted to have an interview with Dr. John Quanrud. He's recently completed his PhD uh, at the University of Nottingham in the uh, early medieval British history, uh, the sources of, of that and sources of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And Dr. Quanrud will tell us more about his story, but um, we're, delighted to, we're delighted to have you, Dr. Quanrud. And, you're, you're one of the first people to research and, and uh, write about the, the history of the Albanian Protestant movement, especially Gerasim Giriazi, at least one of the first foreigners um, to have done that. And in, in 2002, you published a, a book that I found ex extremely helpful, A Sacred Task, a story of Albania's national awakening. And we'd just like to know some of your, your story, some of your history. How is it that, that you come to meet Gerasim Chiriazi and get involved in deciding to study his life? When I was 20 years old, um, I read an article for the first time about Albania. And I, I hadn't heard of Albania before reading that article. Uh, and in it, it said that Albania was the world's first atheist state. And it went on to explain why the leaders of the nation had decided to take that particular path. And it was very anti-God, anti-religion, negative about um, the impact that people of faith have had on human history and society. And, and it was time to clean things up in Albania and perhaps by getting rid of uh, that religious problem and turning into an atheist nation, they'd have a new state that would be a wonderful place to be. And um, when I read that article, Something happened inside me. I just, I knew that things were going to change. Um, I was a young believer at that time, and uh, I was just convinced that if there was a God, he was going to do something about seeing Albania take a, a, a different turn in, in the future. And uh, I somehow sensed that I'd have a part to play in that. And one of the things I felt when I was at that early stage was that um, Jesus wanted to walk in Albanian shoes. The idea of the Albanians seeing what true faith looks like, um, lived out in, in real society. Uh, I didn't know what that would mean. I didn't know how that would come about. But um, I ended up in the late 1980s uh, studying Albanian uh, language at the University of Pristina because Albania at that stage was still closed, still atheist, still communist. and. Um, to learn Albanian, I, I um, <clears throat> took lessons with a young Albanian student at the University of Pristina. And he was passionate about the history of his people. And uh, he was from uh, Macedonia, um, studying in, in Pristina and Kosovo. And uh, part of the things, one of the things that he was teaching me was about Albanian history. And he spoke of the Albanian national movement and something called the Congress of Monastir and the Alphabet Congress when they decided which alphabet to use for the Albanian nation. And I, this is all new to me. I was learning things that I, I didn't know before. And he was so passionate about what he was saying. And one of the families that really, really influenced him uh, was, went by the name of Chiriazi. And they had lived in uh, Bitola or Monastir in, um, in Macedonia. And he went on about that. He'd written a poem about the family that he read to me, and I was trying to understand what he was saying. And but again, seeing that passion in him. And there was me then on the other side thinking, uh, faith and these questions of faith and how to engage with, with that, with, with Bejet, and you know, might he be interested in, in these things? And um, one day, a friend of mine sent me a, a hymn book in Albanian. Uh, totally out of the blue, just said, you might be interested in this. This was published many years ago in Al Albania, I think. And uh, the hymn book was full of hymns by Gerasim Chiriazi. Hmm. And I was very, very surprised. I, I went to Bejet and I said, look, Bejet, here's a, here's a book of, of, of Christian hymns by this, this man that you consider to be such an amazing patriot of the Albanian nation. Do you think it's the same guy? And he said, well, no. <laughs> It, it, no, it can't be the same guy. <laughs> this, this, this isn't right. So we sort of had to talk about, well, could somebody be both a, a man of faith uh, and a patriot of the Albanian nation at the same time? So he went off to, to then try and look into this question for me. I had no idea what materials might be available to study. And he came back with a book one day to me written by Skender Lurasi, mm -hmm. 
1962 in Tirana. And there it explained the problem, or gave a solution that uh, Gerasim, yes, he'd, he'd preach the gospel, yes, he worked for the uh, British and Foreign Bible Society, but no, he wasn't a real believer. And it said that uh, he was basically putting on a front of faith in order to um, uh, get the backing of these foreigners who could then have some political clout and some money behind him. So he was pretending to be a, a Christian in order to uh, carry on his political activities. Right, so did you, were you convinced? Well, I didn't know. I didn't have a basis upon which not to be convinced. So right. I just thought, well, it sounds a little bit convenient for me. Let's, let's, have a, let's see if we can take a deeper look into this issue. Yes. And that led me to eventually look up the British and Foreign Bible Society and the history of that organization. And at that time that Gerasim was operating, it was the Ottoman Empire. Things politically were different. And their main office had been in Istanbul. So mm -hmm. uh, long story short, I ended up going to Istanbul where I found letter books by, written by the, uh, containing the, the correspondence between Gerasim's boss, Alexander Thompson, and Gerasim. And then I, was, I, I started on a, a trek to try and find out who is this man. Is he, is he a complicated person, or you know, do these things all fit together? Uh, and that was the start of what was probably a 10-year journey of, of mm -hmm. discovery into the, the life of this man. Wow. So w when you research someone's life, as, as long as you studied uh, Gerasim's life, you talked about a 10-year journey that still continues today, I'm sure, but uh, you, you, you almost seem like you get to know the man, almost like a, a friend. And I'd just like to know what what you learned about Gerasim. Tell, tell us what he was like. I think one of the things that comes through uh, in reading the things that he wrote, um, most of it's published, so we don't have a lot of his correspondence. Um, you, you get more of a person if you actually can, can get into the correspondence. For example, with Alexander Thompson, we have a lot of his writings. Um, I'll just throw this in, but one of the things with, with Thompson, I remember reading his letters, and you do get absorbed in it, and one of the letters he writes, we've just had news that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And it, it hit me because I was reading it almost like it's contemporary and then suddenly we're reading about a, an event of world history and, and you realize the time that they were living in. Um, but, but for Gerasim, I think one of the things that struck me about him is his energy. Uh, he just had so much to give and was willing to, to put himself out there and, and keep going. Um, he had issues and problems with the authorities, both the religious and secular authorities were very powerful in that part of the world at that time, and he kept going and he, would not, he wouldn't be daunted by any opposition. And uh, he was very creative in, in how he, he came up and, and tried to resolve issues. He's very supportive of the people that worked for him and under him in the Bible Society. Um, the way that he dealt with his sisters, uh, Sevastia, and helping her be educated at a time when Albanian families were opposed to the idea of, of educating women to any stage beyond just the most elementary of, of educations. Um, and standing against that tradition, even within the context of his own family. So creative solutions for difficult issues. Foresight was something else that Gerasim had. He, he spent a period of time captured by a band of brigands and six months in the mountains and almost killed him uh, very early on in his, in his ministry time. And coming out of that experience, rather than thinking, oh, it's hopeless, he's thinking, how can we resolve this issue? This is, this is a real problem. If, if our society is producing people like this, we have no future. So let's, let's do something about this. Let's change the future. Let's think, how can we do that? And he sits down and, and the solution he comes up with is one that, well, who'd come up with it? But he thinks, well, let's, let's educate the, the mothers of a future generation as the quickest way of changing a society. And so he dedicates his life and uh, much of his life and his energy to, to seeing female education developed in the thought that if we educate those girls who will be the mothers of the future generation, they will be then transmitting this information, this, this lifestyle change into the people that grow up. And hopefully we'll be able to avoid having another generation that produces a band of brigands that, like the ones that held me. 
So I, there's, there's so many things about him that are, are just impressive and, well, the, the power of the human spirit to bring about change, the importance of hope, how we understand and perceive the world around us and the way that we engage. I think there's so much that Gerasim has to teach us. As you mentioned earlier, Gerasim seems to have two legacies, one as a, an Albanian patriot, a nationalist figure, and the other as a Protestant preacher. Can you just tell us a little bit about the first one? What, what is it about his life that makes him such a, a national hero and a, and a patriot figure in, uh, in, in Albanian history? To start with, he had the capacity to, for education, to study. Uh, as a young boy, uh, in a poor family, um, he'd been uh, sent out, he had to, had to leave school at the age of, I think, about 13, and he was apprenticed to a shoemaker, and he wanted more. And the arrival of the missionaries next door to his house, and his own path to coming to faith, and then opening up for education and being trained and study, he, he had time to prepare through the circumstances that arose. But then he has the capacity to, to do something with that. And a lot of the Albanian patriot figures that you have from this period, once they're educated, are living then outside of the borders of Albania itself. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy place to live. Christopher really lived inside of Albania. Very few of the rest of them in, in this time are, are actually living in situ and, and, and engaging with the issues and the problems and the people within Albania itself on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's one of the things that's very special about and very unique about Gerasim is that he comes and he, he plants himself in Albanian soil within the borders, within the problems, and he's sharing those problems and issues with the people he's working with. Um, and as he sees this need for education, for training a future generation, and he, he works to, to set up the school that he sets up uh, with his sister eventually in Korcha starting in 1891, and this is a very radical move. And what brings him to the forefront of the national movement is how important this is for the nation that this is done, this, this school for girls that's set up in Korcha. A few years earlier, there's, there's been a, a school for boys that's been established, but this is the first one for girls. Um, because of the political realities of the Ottoman Empire coming to the end of its life and the future is uncertain and, and how significant things like schools and education are going to be, literacy, all of these issues in, Albanian, in the Albanian language. It, it's, it's, a, it's a consequence of the choice that Gerasim has made for the reasons that he's made them, um, that he finds himself at the forefront of this movement. I don't think he sought to be a national leader or figure. He was seeking to bring change. But the, the way that he sought to bring that through, edu through engaging with education, through literacy, um, that then brings him to the forefront of, of what becomes the national movement because these are two, two of the very central issues to what it will, will mean to be an Albanian state in the future. In 1966, Bedri Dedja mentioned that Gerasim Chiriazi was this important national figure that more than anyone else had been buried under the dust of oblivion. Uh, do you think that happened? Why do you think that he was buried and why was his story forgotten or perhaps suppressed? Yeah, I think there's, again, there's, there's perhaps several reasons for that. One of the most important being, um, in order to, to develop an understanding of history, you need time to reflect. And you need people with the capacity and the understanding of a particular period to do that reflection, to discuss, to engage with the sources. And I think, by the time World War II hits, there still hasn't been a lot of time to reflect on Albania's own recent history, the, the national movement. And there's, there's been so much change in Albania from the end of the Ottoman Empire to the beginning of World War II. It's still a period of, of flux, and, and people aren't sitting down to really think through historically what's been happening in their own nation. Uh, Al World War II hits. And then it's the rise of the communist power in Albania. And then you suddenly, Albania's historians, thinkers, reflectors, people that can do this kind of work are restricted within a specific ideological border boundary 
that, that doesn't allow them free reflection. It, it, they, they have to come up with conclusions that fit the, the state's ideology. And Gerasim then becomes a complex figure um, connected with foreigners, religious background. Uh, he, he doesn't fit the profile that they're comfortable with. And it's, he's not easy to rewrite into a, a communist, socialist type of uh, ideology and that, that is comfortable. So I, th I think that's, that becomes one of the main reasons he's then, he's then lost in history. And the people that took on his legacy after his death, the age of 35, uh, in 1894, his sister and, uh, or sisters and then, you know, one of the husbands there, they fall out of favor with the Communist Party as well. So there are ideological reasons, I think, why Gerasim doesn't come to light uh, in, in this period before, before World War II and then from that time. Uh, earlier you referred to Skander Lurasi's work and some comments he made that Chiriazi wasn't wasn't really a believer. He just sort of used his faith to be to give him some leverage for the national cause. Do you agree with that? Does the documentation that you've read support that? Was he sort of faking his his faith? Uh, you know, what's the what's the story behind that story? Uh, the the book by Lurasi uh, was the first my first introduction to to Gerasim, uh, other than the, the hymn book that I had. So you have his hymn book and then this explanation of his life from 1962. Um, as, I, as I started then collecting material and looking into it, you could see that Gerasim was certainly a believer. I mean, whatever else you have to say about the man, um, that faith and faith in Jesus Christ is the core element of, of his raison d'etre for engaging with society and the things that he does is, is, is irrefutable. But I had access to documents that Luarasi would have never seen. Luarasi is working within the context of his own archives, which are quite limited. Most of the material about Chiriazi, which is substantial, is outside of Albania itself, and Luarasi didn't have access to it in 1962. So I, I felt frustrated initially with Luarasi. Um, because I thought, well, this is, this is just propaganda. I had quite negative feelings. But once Albania opened in 1991 and I was able to start engaging with different people and historians and people in the family, what I found about Luarasi was that he actually had a different purpose. Um, his purpose wasn't first and foremost just to enlighten us about the truth of the past as far as this family was concerned. But he was dismayed at the way that Sevastia and Paris Givia had been treated mm. under the communist regime. He was, he was livid with, with the, the fact that history was being overlooked as far as the contribution of those two women was concerned. And Paris Givia was still alive in 1962 and living on all, I don't think she even had a pension. She was, she was impoverished. And he saw them as two of the most important people in the entire Albanian nationalist movement with these two sisters. And so when he wrote the book, his purpose in writing the book was to reinterpret the life of Chiriazi to eradicate this, this issue, these problems that the, the communist state had with their history. So he, he's, not, he's not doing this first and foremost to try and communize Chiriazi, but to try and save save the future for Paris Juvia and, and you know, ease her life. And I think that was successful, was He was it successful, not? yes. yes. They, they, yeah. They're busts, they have, there's busts of each of them in the National Museum. Uh, but there's a story, I don't know if this is a true story. I have heard this, that he walked in once and he saw that, that their statues are downstairs in the museum. And he said, what are these women doing down here? Points upstairs where Enver Hodge's statue stands. Mm -hmm. They should be up there, <laughs> not down here. And, and so it was, uh, that, that changed my, my understanding and perception of, of Lurasi's um, mm. engagement with this, with this whole process. He was, he was writing within the context of the reality of his time um, out of a passion for the work that those sisters had done. And I think that he's correct in his assessment of, of, of how important the, the Chiriazi family has been for Albania. Mm -hmm. Earlier you mentioned the story of Gerasim Chiriazi being taken captive by brigands. Many people don't, don't know anything about that story. Would you just 
briefly tell us what happened, why it happened, uh, and why someone would be interested in, in reading that? Yeah, he, um, Gerasim was very early on in his, his ministry or his work with the Bible Society, um, was based in his hometown of Manastir, Bitola, in Macedonia. And they discussed about where to establish their base initially because there had been very little work done by anyone in Albania itself. Um, so they decided on Monastir. But he really, he, he had a heart for Korcha. He thought Korcha was an important place and he wanted to go to Korcha inside Albania proper and, and engage with the people there and look at the possibilities of establishing something there, maybe booksellers or something. So he planned a trip to Korcha. Uh, and uh, was in a stagecoach on the way over the rough roads, and it would have, they would have been very rough roads at that time, and you could not make great distances like you can today in a car. And he stopped off, they stopped off one night at a han, it's called, or a, an inn, and these are rough places to stay. And he was in the company of a, a Greek woman whose daughter lived in Korcha, and um, they had the, the horse, the, the carriage driver, but what Gerasim didn't know was that the carriage driver was in cahoots with a band of brigands who were looking to kidnap a rich person. Mm. And they had been told that Gerasim was rich and that he worked for a rich foreign society. So they were lying in wait for him beyond the, the inn where they'd stayed their first night. So the next day when they get up early in the morning and they've had a really rough night's sleep and the smoke and the stench of that place, they get back into the carriage and they rough down the roads. And then Gerasim notices that the driver is going very, very, very slowly. He says, well, speed up a bit because we want, we want to make some time today. He says, I know the roads, I know my horses. We're going to go at this speed. And it wasn't long before suddenly down the road, 22 brigands, I think it was, descend from the mountains. And he says they're the roughest looking men he's ever seen in his life. And they demanded to know who Chiriazi was. So they knew he was coming and they took him up in the mountains. But just as they started climbing up the mountains with their new captive, they left the driver and the woman behind, the Turkish police force, whoever they were, ride in on horses and start shooting at them. Mm. And the bullets are whistling over Gerasim's head as well. And he almost, he's almost shot. But anyway, up they go into the mountains and for the next six months he spent a terrible time with, with these men. Um, uh, in different places, they'd, they'd keep him in, locked in a little shack that they used to keep hay for the animals, and he almost died during his six months' captivity. And it allows him time to reflect. He's got all the time in the world on his hands. But, uh, some of the people that are left to, to guard him get bored, so they start throwing burning nails on him, and, and you know, they, they start torturing him just for fun because they're, they're bored and they don't want to do. And again, it's this experience that he's, he's thinking, how do we see this change? This, this, this is not the future for our nation. So he's, he's not worried so much, at least he's not expressing his own concern for himself. He's concerned, he's concerned about his family. Uh, he's concerned about the people that he's with and, and the society that's allowed them to, to come into being. So he wants to see that change. Um, I think the book, the book is very much, he wrote it af, you know, long, long after his, his captivity. He wrote it, I think, in four sections. He gave, he gave them out as lectures that people crowded around to come to listen to him tell about this story. In Korcha. In Korcha. Um, and then they published it as a book. And part of the reason he published it was he wanted to repay the Bible Society who'd paid the, the lion's share of his ransom. And so he was hoping that this telling the story would be a way of, of recouping some of the money that was spent in order to, to free him. Um, uh, Albanians particularly like this story because they're very familiar with all the places that he's talking about and the kind of experiences that, that he has. I think it's, it, it's a little bit more of a challenge for, for people that are less familiar perhaps with Albania to, to read into because there's a lot of Albanian place names and, mm -hmm. and, and things. But it, it is a, it's a very interesting snapshot of the Balkans uh, at the end of the 19th century. And this is in English and Albanian? We, uh, he wrote it in Albanian, uh, but it was published in English. Uh, we republished it in uh, an Albanian translation, and it's also been republished in English, so it's available in both languages. Finally, I'd like to ask a question about uh, our institute. We're grateful that you're 
uh, joining with us in some cooperation on the Institute for Albanian Protestant Studies. And I'm just curious, uh, with all your research, if you would weigh in on why you feel this is so important and so timely to have an institute uh, of this kind at this time. I know that one of the main aims of the institute is to collect, uh, gather together source materials. Um, and one of the things that I, I found probably most surprising when I started out on my journey of discovery about Gerasim Chiriazi was just how much material is available um, about Albania in this period in the archives of the different uh, agencies that were engaged in foreign mission, um, in the diplomatic archives that you have uh, through London, and I'm sure there's other, other archives available through the American mission. It, it, there's, there's an incredible amount of, of, of primary source material um, that's very important for us to, to engage with, not just to understand the, the Protestant history of Albania, but Albania's history overall because of the involvement of um, the Protestant agencies, but also people who belong to them, people like Gerasim, his, his family, and others, Gligor Tsilka, and, and many different people who were both in engaged in in the political process, but also working with these um, Protestant agencies throughout the world, uh, that we, we, need, we need access to these materials. They're, they're very important for, for understanding what happened in Albania, and they allow us to, to, to see it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. and I think as we, as historians, look into a history in a particular sphere, we need all the sources that we can gather in order to understand that. And because of the political history of Albania since World War II, um, there's been limited access to what is perhaps a very important source of material uh, that people haven't had access to. So I think that's one of the really important things that the society can, can offer Albania in the future is access to these materials so anyone can come and, and, and have a look at them and, and benefit from engaging with them, whatever their background. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, joining with us today, this fascinating interview. And we certainly wish you uh, the best now that your PhD work is completed and you're uh, going to be involved in some new things and we're excited about working together in our institute. Thank you, David. Yes.